As you know, uh, this fa- past few months now, uh, we have been discussing the kingdom of God, articulated in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And we're now in a lab section of how the, the, the Sermon on the Mount fits the different cultural norms that we have. He, he is interacting here with both the Ten Commandments and different as- aspects of first century cu- culture, which of course, since it's first century culture, we have to integrate that into what we know and who we are in the 21st century, but we discover that there are, not, are quite a few similarities within that. Today, what we're doing is we're, we're continuing our multi-part discussion of the laws boundarying of our human need for connection, a connection that is most often expressed within our sexuality. And Jesus comes at our sexuality in two ways. He comes at it negatively from the perspective of of adultery and divorce, and He comes at it positively from the standpoint of marriage and the love of God, again, filling it full of Himself which is what Jesus is talking about when He talks about the Law and the Prophets. He did not come to get rid of the Law and Prophets, but to fulfill them, to fill it full of Himself. Now, some of you might be thinking, why in the world are we talking about divorce and sex in the middle of a pandemic? I'm single. Or, I've never been divorced, so what does this have to do with me? Or, okay, I've been divorced, But frankly, I don't want to hear your judgy pastor attitude. So what's on Netflix? Tiger King, King, Adam says. But we miss Scripture's message when we think that it's only about what we think it's about. You see, Scripture is a personal letter to God, from God, and this is important, It's a personal letter from God to His church. Yes, it's a personal letter to you, but it's a personal letter to all of us corporately, and that's important for us to remember. And when we read it, we have to think of it along the lines of all of us. So while you may never have been divorced, we live amongst folks who have, and we are called to care for them and love them. But not only that, there are other things pieces of this that are important for us to unpack that are even relating to divorce. So, for example, while at face value, this stuff is about sex, while it is about marriage, while it is about divorce, it is also, at a much deeper level, about who we are as people in the image of God and how we treasure ourselves, and other people. Now, before we get into this, to piggyback on Adam's sermon of, of, of last week, we, we want to give you some caveats on this. You are not going to hell if you are divorced. Can I get an amen? amen. amen. You are not going to hell if you had sex outside of marriage. Can I get an amen? Amen. You are not going to hell if you committed adultery. Can I get an amen? Amen, Pastor Paul. <laughs> Say it with me. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the call upon our lives when it comes to all things. What we're talking about is the difference between sanctification and salvation. We are saved. We are the beloved of Christ, but Christ doesn't want us to stay in places that are against what the law proclaims as sin. Additionally, in regards to divorce, there are reasons. There are godly reasons for divorce. There is abuse, or what Jesus calls in this text, unchastity, which we'll get into a bit. There is physical abuse. There is mental abuse. There are all the different ways in which life does not become a joy to us, that while we need to work through, it is understandable. Bottom line, life with Jesus is built on grace. But it is grace 
that is lived out in a smart manner. However, we need to beware throwing out Jesus' fulfilling of the law and becoming addicted to grace, cheapening grace by count, not counting sin's horrible claims which devalue life and throw away what God claims. Martin Luther said this. He said, sin that takes mercy and forgiveness for granted is intolerable. So, God's grace must always be experienced hand in hand with the crucified Christ. We must understand that His grace to us was bought on the cross for us at His expense. Only then can we appreciate the nail scars that sin creates. So, what is Jesus talking about with this whole divorce thing? Matthew 5, verse 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. The word of the Lord. And I would understand it if you went, thanks be to God. By now, the you have heard it said, but I tell you has become a, a familiar call and response. So what is it that had been said? What does the Bible say about divorce? Well, Deuteronomy 24 outlines the, the uh, process and reason for divorce, and it's what Jesus is reflecting on in Matthew 5, 31 and 32. In verse 1 it says, Suppose a man enters into marriage with a woman, but she does not please him because he finds something objectionable about her. And so he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of the house. Now, as we reflected on at the beginning of, of my time with you today, this is all from the perspective of a particular time. It sounds extremely cold to our 21st century ears, but it was a huge step forward for its time because men, for it was always men, were div divorcing their lives for capricious reasons with very little blowback for them. And Deuteronomy 24 verse 1 was a huge step forward for its time because from the point of this law on, a man had to present his wife with at least the dignity of a document indicating the divorce was his decision and not hers. Why is that important? Well, first of all, it freed her from shame. Secondly, it gave her the possibility of being married again, which was hugely important because women could not live in the cultures that we're talking about without being married. Take a look at the sidebar that I gave you in the, in the notes about uh, what that, what, how the church participated in the ability of people to live a single life. So, while this was groundbreaking for the 7th century B.C. feminism, by the 1st century, our faith grandparents take on this was the same as how most of us deal with difficult issues. It was complicated, and it was laced with, okay, but what's in it for me? In the first century, there were two major Jewish schools of thought about this one. One was from the school of Shammai. When I say schools, what I mean is, is that there were rabbis who would go around and they, they would be teaching a particular kind of uh, theology and understanding of the Talmud. And so one of those schools was called Shammai. And it said the only reason for divorce was sexual immorality. Another, Hillal, a school, said that a man could divorce his wife for almost any reason at all. For example, burning his food. Much later, past the time of Christ, at the school of Aqaba went even further, saying that if a man found a more attractive woman than his wife, that was grounds for divorce. So Jesus' words obviously bore a lot of fruit here, huh? 
So obviously, Jesus aligns himself with the first school. He's going to do a far deeper dive on this in Matthew 19, which we'll get to in March of 2055. But for now, his disclaimer of on the grounds of unchastity takes us back to Adam's sermon of last week. And it connects us with our poetic beginnings in Genesis, where God tells us that male and female relationships are a gift from God, and they are not to be thrown away. Jesus says, in agreeing with the school of Shammai, he says that, that the reason for divorce, in his opinion, is that of unchastity. And that word, unchastity, comes from the Greek word pornea. And it is where we get the word pornography. Bottom line, pornea means throwing sexuality into the dirt. And this is not God's intention about anything. God doesn't want us to throw anything in the dirt. God made it. It is good. God wants it to be lifted up. So, what is God's intention for sex and love and for marriage? Well, flip over into Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And it contains the first not good of creation. God said, verse 18, It is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a suitable helper as his partner. The word suitable translates the Hebrew word kanego, which means powerful. Helper translates the Hebrew word izar and means ally. So, the first not good of creation is the lack of a suitable helper, the lack of a powerful ally. And so the text continues in verse 19. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal and every bird and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called them, that was his name. Don't get weirded out here. This is poetry. We're not telling us that this is how God created animals and all those sorts of things. Verse 20. So the man gave them all names, but no suitable helper was found as his partner. There it is again. It's doubled use, suitable helper, powerful ally, Emphasis, emphasizes importance. So, what is God's fix for this first not good? Verse 21. God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And as he slept, he took one of the ribs, one of his ribs, and closed up the place with flesh. The rib that God took from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man and then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Again, this is poetry. It is, it is not telling us what happened at that moment. It is telling us what always happens, what is. Not of what we can make an Instagram post, but what moves us? Rib comes from the Hebrew word Tesla and means an electric car. <laughs> no. Rib comes from the Hebrew word Tesla, which is a good translation of the word rib, but it's a bad translation of the poetry. Because Tesla means rib, but the context is deeper. The context is side. And so the woman was taken from the man's side. In other words, he is halved. Take a look at the sidebar that I gave you in the sermon notes there on, the, on that idea. The woman is brought to the man, and his aloneness is transformed because at last he now has a suitable helper. He at last has a powerful ally. And so when he sings, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, this one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. He is saying this. He is saying, she is like me, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She is not like me, for out of me she was taken. Now, flip back over to Jesus' statement on divorce. It was also said in Deuteronomy 24, 1, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, which is pornea, throwing sexuality under the ground, causes her to commit adultery. 
Okay, what's that about? Well, in order to understand that, we have to refer back to Adam's sermon of last week. Whoever marries a divorced woman causes her to commit adultery. Jesus is hearkening back to the not good of creation, and he's hearkening back to the way in which Adam talked about the powerful nature of sex. You see, divorce strips people back to their lonely selves with no powerful ally, with no suitable helper. The law, which Jesus fulfills, stands as a boundary to that sin. Last week, Adam compared sex with, do you remember what it was? With fire. And fire is an incredibly powerful element. It is why sex is part of the law, why it's so important for us to talk about, it, why it's so important for us in the midst of a t- pandemic when people are, are locked in houses together in abusive sometimes situations to be able to ask questions about this. And it is why Jesus comes down so hard on its misuse. Both the people of Jesus' day and the people of our day tend to minimize the power of sex. But Jesus knows the danger. Sex is powerful because it connects us to an other, an other person, which connects us to God and can, it, when we take it away, reverts us to the not good of creation when it is not viewed in the proper manner. When sex becomes something that we use, when sex becomes a fast food commodity, when sex and marriage become something that we throw in the dirt, pornea, or throw away, we're in trouble because we are throwing away our suitable helper, our powerful ally. In Genesis, man and woman are made by God from the raw material of each other. Take a look at that other sidebar I gave you there. The woman is made as the man's powerful ally. She is the one who is like him, and she is the one who is not like him, and whom, together with God, they forge a life. And that's why Jesus crafts all this in the language of fulfillment. You see, the people of Jesus' day had watered this down and fudged the law to mean I can divorce you if you burn my eggs. Or I can divorce you if I find somebody more attractive than you. But the whole of Scripture stands against throwing people away. Today, we find ourselves in a hugely similar situation in the middle of a global pandemic. What do we do? Do we stay closed? Do we stay in social distancing to save lives? Or do we sacrifice the weak so that our financial institutions can open and save us from depression and recession? Do we throw people away? What does the Bible say about this? The Bible says that God creates and sustains. The Bible says that God has given us suitable helpers and powerful allies. And it tells us that when we throw people away because their life is deemed less important than our bloated economy or we don't like their politics or they don't make us happy or they burn our eggs or we are going against the full intent of what Christ wanted us to do because we want to do it, or we're not Jewish, we're Christian, and we don't need to worry about those laws, we are forgetting the fact that Jesus Christ himself came to fulfill marriage and divorce and love and sex and all relationships. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we are so thankful that you love us that your desire for us is that we would have each other. Lord, we are sorry for the times that we throw people away. And we are grateful 
that you have called us into a community even though right now we have to be separated. Lord, we pray for that person in that ambulance who's heading to St. Joe's right now. We pray that, that we would grieve the loss of our relationships right now and that we would take this opportunity to reach out to all people. Lord, if we are in a situation right now in which we are afraid of our husband or wife or the people in our, our house, we just pray that, that you would provide for us people who would be able to enter into that brokenness. Counselors, friends, people who would be able to let all people know that they are not to be thrown away, but there is a right and there is a wrong. In your name we pray. Amen.